I, I'd really like to, to thank Task and to Francis and, and, and Paul and, and Nat for giving me the opportunity to come and, um, and respond to this great presentation by Thomas Piketty. I, I've been an enthusiast for his work for some time, actually. Um, uh, I, I don't know why, it's just, um, we, we have a sort of, although he's a lot younger than me, he, he's been in, 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 he went to the LSE like I did, and maybe he thinks the same way uh, at a higher level, but in the somehow, you know, the way he approaches the problems, uh, the topic that he chooses, it's the neglected nature of this topic, the evolution of, of wealth, capital, um, it is a neglected topic in economics, and uh, he's, he's really uh, opened up a, a huge area that had been forgotten. It's not, all, not neglected through history, but it has been neglected for the last, I would say, uh, quarter century. I like in the book the fantastic historical sweep, and you've seen some of this going from the uh, right into antiquity, and then especially the discussion of the Gilded Age, uh, to the age of, of financialization. We didn't really have a Gilded Age in Ireland. We were, we were busy doing other things in the late 19th century, but we certainly had uh, financialization with a vengeance. So I certainly liked, um, I, I liked that, that historical perspective. And I found fascinating the the analysis of the destruction of wealth and of wealth concentration, two entirely different uh, processes but, but linked in the 20th century and, and how we may have become complacent about uh, the distribution of wealth because of something quite extraordinary that happened in the 20th century. A number of things that were extraordinary that happened in the 20th century, the wars, um, the, the welfare state as well as the wars um, that were leading to ta taxation uh, rates as we've seen that are not the rates that we see today. Um, and I, there are resonances, as I'll come to in a minute, with our current position with a, a destruction of wealth, as, as it appeared in, in, um, in recent times in Ireland. I also like kind of matter-of-fact concern that uh, Toma has with inequality. So he's not here... Uh, you know, he's, there aren't any red flags flying, but the, the theme of inequality is absolutely central. I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious to him and to me that inequality matters a lot in, in our societies and, and could matter a lot more if, if, um, if certain things happen. And I very much differ with those who have, um, who have reviewed his book uh, in various places and said, well, um, what's, what's all this inequality? It doesn't matter. Just growth is the only thing that matters. I don't think that's right. Um, and in his book, I think you'll find fascinating the discussion of the contrasting role of inheritance and accretion of, of wealth in generating wealth inequalities and how different forces have been at work at, at different times. Particularly the, the growth of, of uh, super salary income in the last, uh, I guess, 30 or 40 years compared to um, the inheritance mechanism that was there in the 19th century. And then, of course, there's the famous R minus G dynamic, this neglected dynamic. So R minus G. I don't remember R minus G from uh, my days at, at um, UCD or, or at the LSE. And then you say, economists then say, what is this R minus G? Oh, that's obvious. Okay, so maybe it is obvious, but why did we not talk about it, and why did we not study it, and why did we not see the force and importance of it? So I think that is really, you know, it's a, a really valuable insight. And you know, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there's no however. I'm not going to say however. <coughs> there, uh, Oh, of course, there'll be there's lots of lots of debates, lots of questions and discussions. Um, but for me, the book is just a tour de force, and I don't want to come and then quibble and critique and if and but. Uh, what I would like to do in the time that I have is to is to pull out a, a couple of charts and show you the Irish context, particularly the context over the the, the boom and bust period, and how that in a way links up. With, uh, with the sorts of things that Thomas has been talking about with a much greater sophistication and, and a lot more, more detail. And, and look at the Irish crisis through this, through this 
special lens, a lens of data on capital and wealth. And that's really, that's really the focus of the book. Here is data and data on capital. Uh, not so much data, a lot of data on income inequality, a lot of data on lots of things, but especially on capital wealth. Well, do we have the data for Ireland, and can we? Uh, uh, well, at the aggregate level, and trend, aggregate trends in household wealth and in, in pub public sector wealth and so forth, uh, we do have that data at least for the last uh, 10, or 10 or 15 years, and then in, in, a, in a spottier way, uh, going back before that, and, and I'll, I'll show you some stuff about that. Uh, on distribution, we actually don't have, we more or less don't have uh, data on the distribution of wealth in Ireland. Um, I'll qualify that in a minute. Now, now, we do have data on income distribution, and in the spirit of the first slide that, that um, turns out that it was this first slide that, that Toma had, it was, uh, I think, um, the top income share, the top decile in the United States. And he showed it coming down in the first half of the, of the 20th century, uh, Kuznets data he mentioned, and the 50s, 60s, 70s flat, and then it started to rise in the 1980s. And the data we have in Ireland, actually I see uh, Brian Nolan's in the front row, he's, uh, it's his, all the errors are in his. <laughs> um, so this is data from Brian. He also has collected data. It's based on income tax sources, and, and he has some data for earlier years, but the, the, the steady series runs from, from the 1970s. And we see here in Ireland exactly the same story as in the United States, an upward trend, a very clear upward trend in the share of the top 10%, and indeed in the top 1% of, of, of income, income in Ireland. Uh, and by the way, and the same pattern mentioned by Tom, but, but not shown, but we can actually see it here. Okay, if you just look at the blue line, that's the share of the top 10%. The, uh, the green line, or yellow, whatever it is, line, is more or less parallel. In other words, the increased share of the top 10% is actually the increased share of the top 1%. The next 9%, God help them, did not increase their share. So actually, they're not the same people, 1975, 2008, but it is, uh, so, so the very parallel development here in Ireland. But that's income distribution. What about wealth? Well, uh, there's a chart that, uh, one, one of the charts in, in the book, uh, you saw some charts like this. This is capital in Britain, uh, 1700 to 2010. And what you see is this uh, big collapse in, the, in wealth in the, uh, after the First World War and in, in mid-century mid here. So we have dramatic changes. Okay, it's a long time, fr time scale, um, but we have dramatic changes in wealth. Its wealth is normalized by income here, but you could say if it's, it's a fall in wealth. Uh, and do we have anything like that for Ireland? Well, we don't have a long data series, but we have from 2002, and we see a, not as big, but also a sizable fall in, in wealth. This is household wealth. I'm not going to go into all the little details. I don't, can't match everything that uh, Toma has, but this is, I think, the most relevant number, which is household wealth net worth in Ireland and I'll go into this in a little more detail in a minute. So you can see the same sort of pattern. We, we have our own little mini crash of wealth in Ireland. It's not as, as steep as the UK, uh, as the British one, or, or many of the other European ones in the war time, but it's our own little, it's not a war we had, but it, it, it feels like it from some point of view. And that, and that is the series right up to, it's a quarterly series, and it, it's maintained by the Central Bank, and uh, you see a reference to an article by some of my colleagues. Um, who have uh, who maintained this uh, data series. And we have we separated out between housing assets, financial assets, and debt. I'll come back to it, because it's quite interesting to dig a little bit into it. Um, so there have been, but that's not distribution. That's the aggregate wealth in the economy. And lots of people have studied distributional issues in Ireland during the crisis uh, run up to, and especially since the crisis, what has happened to the distribution of um, income? Uh, yeah, income. There's uh, there's a Gini coefficient and the quintile share ratio. There's all sorts of ways of measuring inequality. We have the the share of the top. 10%, uh, 1%. If you want to dig down into the rest of the distribution, you have to find some summary statistics, and everybody has their favorite one. Uh, so th what's quite interesting here is uh, in the boom years, uh, high is, at least for this audience, high is uh, bad and low is good here, right? So 
the, the, <laughs> the EM. So, so you see both of these measures are, are higher in the, in the boom period and then the crash improves the distribution because at first it's the higher income groups that relatively lose relatively more. But then as the recovery star, or the crash ends and the recovery gradually take, takes hold, uh, we see a, a ret return. Now, warning about income distribution, these are all measures of relative inequality. How, they don't care about the size of the pie, they say how is the pie distributed. But if you've got a smaller pie, and it's distributed just as une unequally as before, that's, that means that the people at the bottom are very much squeezed because um, it's harder for them to cope with, with reductions. It's very important to, to bear that in mind when you're talking about inequality of, of income. Uh, so people have looked at uh, economic stress and how that has been distributed among different classes of society, material deprivation. I have a, a, um, a, a presentation which will be on, on uh, some website and will have citations to papers that you might like to dig into for, for these bits of data. Mortgage distress, that's something that we've been studying extensively, obviously, at the Central Bank, and the distribution between different types of people, different uh, types of household, different classes, and so forth labor market experience. Role of the state in affecting this. That's an, one just, I'll just show you this one from the ESRI, from Tim Callan and his colleagues. Um, this, one, this one has been updated every year, and now it shows you that what the state, the budgets have done. Obviously, their budget has had to be compressed dramatically, but how has it affected different deciles in society, the state's budget? Um, and now after five years, earlier on it was skewed more like that, that the, the higher income groups were paying a lot more uh, as a result of budgetary action than the lower income groups. Now it's not so skewed, it's almost proportional. The uh, most affected group, yes, at the top, but the second most affected, uh, the, the one at the bottom. Having said that, um, actually um, the ch there has been a sort of zero change in, in income inequality uh, along the deciles. If you, if you take OECD figures that were published today. But it is interesting, the role of the state and how it has shifted, and that's one, one worth digging into. Um, but still, that's not wealth. That's, that's to do with income. Uh, we had, we, the ESRI did a su survey in 1987. Uh, and again, Brian uh, uh, and, and Nolan, sorry, myself, studied that. But 1987, are you interested in how distribution of income? I didn't think you were interested in the distribution of wealth in 1987. Uh, so we won't talk about that, but that is the only comprehensive survey. But there will be another comprehensive survey. Uh, the, it's a euro area-wide exercise, household finance and consumption survey. We did not, Ireland did not uh, participate in that before in, in, in 2008 or seven or whenever it was carried out before. The 2013 wave, ha the survey has been done, the data is being cleaned, and so soon we'll have some information. So, but it'll only be the first snapshot. We won't be able to say, and this compares with something in the past. But we, so it will, it will improve and we'll be able to start talking about whether there is, uh, whether that patrimonial middle class is getting a bigger share or a, a smaller share. Um, there's a, there are a few bits, partial bits and pieces. There's an older people's capital position, the tilde survey. So this is the sort of information you'd like to have. A box, a box charts with the median and the quartiles and, and, and so forth. But that's only for, the, for the, the older people. We don't care about older people. Oh, sorry, no, no, we do care about older people. Uh, now, um, so since there's no data on distribution I, I'm free to make some speculation. But let me show you the aggregates a little in more detail. You saw the one I had quarterly from 2002 to 2013. And I want to zoom in on three particular years, which turn out to be the first date in the series, which is early 2002. Another date exactly five years later, the middle of 2007, which happens to be the highest measured wealth. And exactly five years after that, the lowest uh, measured wealth. Um, which is 2012 quarter two. And I'll also show you the latest data, but I want to, uh, to home in on those. Measured household wealth peaked in, 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 uh, in the second quarter of 2007 at 719 billion euros. And that was up almost 300 billion from five years below. So up from 400 and something billion to 719. And by 2012, it was back to more or less the 400 
again. Why? Well, you can just see the main components there. Uh, financial assets, the blue one. Now, people saved during 2002 to 2007, and then there were rates of return on, on investments and so forth. So that went up. And then they invested in property, in the green line. But in order to invest in the property, they borrowed the red line. But the pro prices of the property went up. So the green line went up even higher. So that was the mechanism. In case you've forgotten the way the house prices went, um, there they are, very familiar car, peaking more or less at that time, the early part of 2007. <clears throat> so that can't have been too painful. It went up and went down and was back to where it was again. Well, of course, it was painful because it's not the same people. N not everybody moved in lockstep, borrowing the same amount of money, buying the houses at the same time. So there's a huge churn, a huge distributional effect. Some people uh, doing a lot worse than other people. Household debt in particular rose very quickly. It was the third highest ratio, debt to income ratio, in Europe. And it did not, of course, fall back by much. And another element to add a fourth bar to those is the position of the government. Back in 2002, so the government's net debt position was close to zero. It was almost exactly zero in 2007. But after 2007, the government's net financial asset position has deteriorated by about 150 billion euros. And that has put the government in a position where there's not an awful lot more it can do by way of borrowing to correct and adjust the problems. It can do other things, but it can't do much by way of, of borrowing. About, of the 150 billion, it's about a third come from the bailout of bank creditors and the remainder from the process of smoothing the budgetary adjustment. So the budget deficit opened up widely because tax revenue is gone. So the government smoothed that, successive governments. They didn't just say, oh, no revenue anymore, so we cut down everything. It may feel like that, but actually they smoothed it a lot, smoothed it much more gradually than in Greece or Spain, and that means a lot more debt by, by the middle of 2012. Okay, so that means it's not painless, of course, if you, because it, the household, even if the household doesn't owe, owe the government debt, the household sector is going to have to pick up the pieces through taxation uh, over the coming years. So you, you could sort of add together the household and the, but the government position. I'm not going to go into the corporation, the corporate sector. That lets that, that be a technical discussion. Terribly difficult to in, integrate the corporate uh, figures into this because of the role of multinational corporations and that. And I think this gives the essential, the essential picture. And you can see the government plus household net wealth, the way that's moved up, down, and then slight improvement to 2013 quarter for all. I think I haven't referred constantly back to, to the presentation, but I think you can see that the concepts that I'm using are as, you know, as close as, as I can in a short period of time to, uh, to what, uh, what Toma has been, been focusing on, but really concentrating on our crisis and how these great big secular movements can be affected by a, a, short, uh, a, a short period of time where dramatic effects happen. And just do something slightly animated here, just so that you, I can get through again that story of what happened between 2002, 2007, 2012. So there's 2002, financial assets are in blue, the debt, not so much, in red, housing assets, okay, in green, and the government net debt. And then five years later, at the peak of the bubble, oh, sorry, five years later at the peak of the bubble, Financial assets have gone up, housing assets have gone up a lot, and debt has gone up. These are billions of, of, of euros. And then after the bust, 2012, quarter two, the housing wealth has collapsed down again, essentially because the prices have gone down. The debt is still there. The financial assets are still there. And the government has assumed a lot of net debt. That's the story at the aggregate. The distribution, oh, that's 2013, quarter four, not much has changed. So the whole 
size distribution of wealth uh, moved to the left on those charts. So the rich people on average had less and the poor people on average had, le had less. A whole size distribution moved to the left. It moved those at the bottom of the distribution into very negative wealth positions. Now, is there more wealth inequality as a result of this process starting in 2002 and, and today? Uh, I'm just going to say, we may take it that there has been much wider inequality. I thought of spending five minutes to try to go through step by step why I think that is so. But I, um, I thought that, uh, I think it's un unnecessary. I think we may take it that the distribution has widened considerably as a result of the, the crisis. Furthermore, there has been a churn. It's not just a question of analyzing the relative impact of the bust on those who were rich first before the boom before, uh, versus those who were poor before the boom. There's, for example, there's the loss of net worth. It was concentrated on those, mainly on those who borrowed mid-decade. Mid and this group was in turn concentrated on the age group 30 to 45. That's well known. There's a chart. That's from um, um, an ESRI CSO uh, paper, distribution of, of people in negative equity and borrowing. And that's a huge change in society as well. So what should government be doing about all this stuff? And as I've mentioned, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of difficult for, for uh, the government when it is so strapped. And actually, it's something that society should be thinking about and is thinking about, but I find a huge divergence, fundamentally different views, fundamentally different approaches to the questions of ownership and debt as they apply to this crisis. On the one hand, I meet a lot of what I would call contract fundamentalists. Say, okay, I'll just pay. Um, do you sign here? Where's the money? And, they, and that's, of course, very important. <laughs> we can't, the system can't go if people don't honor their, 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 um, their debts. But, but fundamentalists who disregard the extreme nature of the crisis that has occurred and has caused situations where actually the contracts cannot be fulfilled. On the other hand, there are those who say, well, I don't have any, I don't attach any importance to conventional principles of ownership and, and private property. And with such a wide discrepancy of views, I don't think there has been a, a very uh, uh, well-connected discussion about how the society should have coped with this situation or how it is coping with this situation. Now, different societies have dealt with problems like this in different ways. Very often, a, a boom and bust cycle has ended in a huge wave of inflation. That's actually the way most of these boom and bust crises have ended. Uh, they, the, the inflation redistributes wealth as well. So the bust redistributes wealth and inflation redistributes wealth in a different way and there's a sort of rough and ready uh, crisis over. There are still a lot of debris and a lot of people who, uh, it, it's, it's not a, a perfect offset. Um, it, it's, it's very crude way of, of, of resolving these situations. And we know that there are subsequent output losses, so in, in, con, con, those countries don't do very well after that. So anyway, it's not on the cards. We don't actually have a, a, a domestic control over, over inflation. We, we, um, so so uh, there's no point in, in talking about it. But it is worth remembering, uh, speaking to the contract fundamentalists, that that, that has been uh, something that's happened in, in those in many other countries over, the, over history. But the state has little capacity then and little appetite for a transfer from taxpayers. I didn't say taxpayer burden, I just said from taxpayers to those indebted households who can still afford to service their debts. So a carefully phrased sentence there. So there's little appetite, I observe little appetite for a transfer from taxpayers to those indebted households who can still afford to service their debts. I think most people, I think that's a statement of fact. So we're back into the arena of um, insolvency legislation, and that has been modernized. I don't need to uh, in inform this audience about, why not? Yes, I'm going on too long, you're quite right. Uh, this part is not very interesting anyway. 
So, uh, <laughs> I just want to say that in the Central Bank, we have really tried to think hard about these questions and tried to find out-of-the-box solutions, tried to find, uh, you know, could there be a one-size-fits-all debt modification scheme that, for un unaffordable debt? That, and no matter how hard we try, we can't find something that, that, uh, that works. Everything that we came up with was poorly targeted and, 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 and too costly. So we do agonize over this thing. I think society should agonize over it. I don't know that there are better ways out of this than we have so far found. If there were, we would have been loudly advocating them. I think Thomas' book has really highlighted the fact that this is not just a particular type of problem that we're facing, but it's an aspect of large historic movements in, uh, in, in wealth, in capital, and debt that are important in economic history and for the future of our, all our societies. So I'm sorry for going on too long, Paul, no, but no, uh, there fine. you are. I'm very talkative. Perfect. Guy. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs>